Hi everyone, <laughs> even though I was just saying hi to you, but hi again now that we're recording. So this is the official hi. Um, we'll get started, it's 12 o'clock. Before we get formally into the event, I'd like to recognise the traditional owners of the lands that we're on as we connect today. And I note that we're not all collected in a single place. So I'm on Ngunnawal and Nambri land here in Canberra. And I acknowledge the Nambri and Ngunnawal elders, both past and present. I also welcome and pay my respects to folks that are joining us from many First Nations, recognising that there's both great diversity between nations and also a shared struggle for sovereignty and recognition. And many of the other folks that are joining us um, in the webinar will be on the lands of other nations. There are so many in Australia. It's important that we take stock of whose lands we're living on as we work and we think and we connect and we talk. So please think about whose lands it is that you're on based on wherever in the world you are. And for the sake of any folks that are international who might be listening, and I hope there might be some, the reason we make these acknowledgements in Australia is that in this country, the First Nations never ceded sovereignty of their lands, but we have no treaty. So thanks for joining us today for Read Research Notes. Uh, this is our first webinar in a new series hosted by the Resources, Environment and Development Group in the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy. So we're in a virtual rather than a physical space, and that's very much thanks to COVID, but it does actually open up potential for new connections that we can make and new opportunities for So hopefully there'll be some of these benefits of using the virtual space for these events. In this webinar series, we'll be holding conversations with researchers from REED, so REED being Resources, Environment and Development, but also the broader REED research network too. And so these will be conversations about current thought and advances in research. Uh, we're recording the webinar and we'll make it available via the REED website too. And this will go for future webinars as well. So hopefully it will give lovely opportunity to re-engage with the ideas that we talk about, but also catch up if you can't join us. Um, if you have found out through perhaps a secondary information source about the webinar today, please feel free to send me an email or Maeve or Siobhan or really anyone from Reed to say that you'd like to be alerted to future webinars so they can pass them on to us and we'll keep a mailing list going. I should probably introduce myself. So my name is Beck. I'm a lecturer here in the Reed group at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Um, I'm teaching at the moment, or well, not right now, but earlier this morning I was, um, on environmental policy type issues. So I'm a social scientist and interested in aspects of social interaction. Um, I'm moderating the discussion today, so you won't hear too much from me. Um, you will hear from our wonderful speakers though, and we're going to be exploring decolonizing the Anthropocene. And this is a convergence of two critical topics that I have no doubt will be very thought provoking and enriching. So we'll hear from two of our treasured read academics. First, we'll hear from Maeve Powell, who's a PhD scholar and academic with the read program. And then second, we'll hear from Dr. Siobhan McDonald, who's a senior lecturer with the read program as well. Um, after their presentations, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers and more discussion. They'll introduce both of our speakers before their presentations. We're going to be starting with May. So as we're going, please share your questions. I ask that you use the Q&A function in Zoom um, as opposed to the chat. So the chat's a great place to say hi or what a wonderful point and aren't these people wonderful? But if you've got questions that you'd like, to be included in the Q&A or points for discussion, please do use that Q&A function. That's what we'll be drawing from. I'd also like um, to mention that anything that's posted to the chat or the Q&A will be visible to the panel and the other attendees, potentially. So at the same time as welcoming your questions, genuinely welcoming them, we also ask that you're respectful and constructive in what it is that you put forward into this open forum. So we'll start by hearing from Maeve. So Maeve Powell is a NIMPA PhD scholar and academic with the Reed Group. She teaches on land rights while she's undertaking her own PhD research. She's also, as well as Australia, previously studied in Norway and the USA. And her work is positioned within trans-Indigenous scholarship, so intersecting Indigenous studies with critical geography. 
Her work examines issues of spatial decolonization, urban indigenous belonging, digital story mapping and indigenous education. I learned so much from Maeve about the histories and the power embedded in much of what we take for granted in the spaces that we move in day to day. So this spans from the design of the city of Canberra through to the contours of the ANU campus that we pass by on a daily basis. So I'll mute myself now and I'll hand over to Maeve to talk to us. Thank you. Thanks, Beck, for the lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, let's see if this works. And slideshow. Is that working for everyone? Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so um, my paper today is titled The Fleshy Philosophies of the Anthropocene, Indigenous Futurism, Time and Country. And um, this paper is based on one that was presented earlier this in January this year um, and that will become relevant in a moment. Um, the outline for this paper, I'll first focus on what I mean by philosophy fleshy philosophies of the Anthropocene. And then I'll talk a little bit about what Indigenous futurism is. And then give a brief discussion of the Swan Book by Alexis Wright and Terra Nullius by Claire Coleman. Um, and this is an appropriate topic because coincidentally today is Indigenous Literature Literacy Day. Yeah. Um, so I, as I said, um, this paper was delivered in January this year. And when I was preparing it, Canberra was experiencing, I was based in Canberra and we were experiencing one of the worst bushfire seasons ever on record. And this photo was taken on Mount Ainsley on New Year's Day. Um, it was 10 in the morning and you can see how dark and cloudy with smoke the air was. I think we had the highest pollution factor in the world on that day. Um, and it really, um, was emblematic of a really difficult time period. The bushfires burned over uh, 5 million hectares of land in, in Australia. 1 billion animals were killed. The air turned toxic. Water was contaminated with ash and fish kills, which is the sudden mass death of wild fish, were extensive in both coastal and inland waterways. These events served as a stark reminder that the philosophies of the Anthropocene have fleshy consequences impacting on bodies and land. So these ideas around, um, this photo was also taken at that time, and these ideas around the fleshy philosophies of the Anthropocene have been influenced by the work of Heather Davis and Zoe Todd, who are Canadian and Métis respectively. And their argument is that by pinpointing the beginning of the Anthropocene epoch with 1610 and the advent of Columbian exchange as proposed by geographers Barry and Maslin has implications for evaluating the concept itself. They problematize the concept of the Anthropocene, arguing that it is a universalist term and that the concept is an extension and enactment of colonial logic by erasing difference and positioning the Eurocentric, positioning Eurocentric epistemologies as neutral. They argue that anthropogenic climate change is not an inevitable result of human nature, but is a result from the processes of colonialism. And I'll read you a short quote from their paper because it's an incredible piece of academic writing. They say, quote, the seismic shock of dispossession and violence that colonialism employed to gain entry into and claims over indigenous lands kept rolling like a slinky, pressing and compacting in different, way, in different ways in different places as colonialism spread outwards into homelands of self-determining peoples around the globe. This work to compact and speed up time laying waste to legal orders, languages, place story in quick succession. The fleshy, violent loss of 50 million Indigenous peoples in the Americas is something we read as a quickening of space-time in a seismic sense." Unquote. So 
Todd and Davis instead posit that to address crises like climate change, we must engage with processes of decolonization, reasserting indigenous epistemologies and relations with land, plants and animals. Carl Powis White, who is a Potawatomi scholar, also critiques conceptualizations of the Anthropocene. He observes that imaginaries of climate change crises are not universal, and that for many indigenous peoples, the present crisis is part of the ongoing crisis of colonization. He sees indigenous science fiction as, a challenge, as challenging linear narratives of dreadful climate change futures. He argues that representations of climate crisis within indigenous science fiction offers up different imaginaries of apocalyptic futures because the indigenous present are ancestral dystopias. And this links into the ideas of indigenous futurism. And the term was coined by Grace Dillon to refer to a body of science fiction texts by indigenous authors. They differ from mainstream texts, which often rely on, quote, the victimized noble savage trope in order to relive Wild West fantasies. And instead, indigenous futurism texts position indigenous peoples as agents in vital futures. Indigenous futurisms make no distinction between mind, body and spirit, as opposed to mainstream sci-fi, which is based on the Cartesian divide. And these texts take the fiction out of science fiction. The stories are true and can inform how we live in the present. Dylan sees indigenous futurisms as a healing praxis of stories of indigenous survivance, which can inform ways of living out indigenous futures in the present. The two texts that I'd like to discuss are shown here. The first is The Swan Book by Alexis Wright. And this book is set in a dystopian future at the side of a toxic and polluted swamp. And I'll quote, in every neck of the woods, people walked in the imagination of doomsayers and talked the language of extinction. The main character living in these times is Oblivion Ethelene, who is a Aboriginal woman who's pulled from a hollow in a eucalyptus tree by a gypsy woman named Belladonna in a Northern Australia still under intervention. She later goes on to marry Warren Finch, the first Aboriginal president of Australia, when she is taken into the South to live in an inundated city and becomes increasingly isolated. The second text is Terra Nullius. It is a story of colonial Australia, of conflict between natives and settlers. The characters of Jackie, Sister Bagra, Esperance and Johnny are navigating this conflict. And just a heads up, I will be giving a spoiler later on for Terra Nullius. There's a pretty big twist. I'll, I'll tell you when, and then I'll give you a thumbs up when the spoiler is over so you can mute me and then unmute me. So both texts um, tell uh, stories that can inform the way we see the world and the way we understand relationships to country, non-human kin, and the way we conceptualize time. Terra Nullius is a story of belonging and of removal from the land. And one example I'll give is a quote. Then the settlers came and brought their own crops, their own animals. Native livestock had been killed to leave room for the settler animals and that left nothing to eat other than settler animals. Settlers called it stealing. And in this way, Claire Coleman is um, giving us an understanding of this idea of property and of how colonization impacted on the land and relationships to the land. The Swan Book is also a story of belonging and of returning. The main character, Oblivion, has a virus in her head and this is in symbolic of um, the quest to decolonize the mind as she pursues uh, indigenous futures. 
It is also a story of Indigenous knowledge and the power of knowledge for saving the world in a time of climate crisis. Both books tell stories of relations with non-human kin and respect for the kin. In Terra Nullius, Jackie is saved by a kangaroo. He narrowly avoids massacre when the kangaroo that he has killed becomes too heavy for him to carry and hence he is kept behind while the rest of his family is killed. This saving is twofold. Not only does he avoid the massacre, but the flesh of the kangaroo feeds him. And in this way, his life is entwined with that of the kangaroo. In Swan Book, Oblivion's life is entwined with the life of the swan, a black swan and the swan later leads her home from the south back to the north. She is also saved. And both texts also give us lessons for time. As opposed to time being linear, they conceptualize time as non-linear. Spoilers ahead, mute me if you don't want it. So in Terranalius, the main twist is that a text which at first appears to be in the past of relationships between Aboriginal and settler in Australia, halfway through the novel, we find out that the natives are humans and the settlers are slimy, frog-like aliens who have invaded Earth. And the conflict between these settlers and natives is taking place in Australia as one of the last frontiers of contact between humans and the settlers. In this way, Coleman is reconceptualizing our idea of time. What was the past we now see is the potential dystopian future. Past becomes future. At the end of the novel, we see Esperance walking off into an uncertain future, standing in her strength. In this way, what is positioned as a future, potential future, is also the present for many Indigenous people. Spoilers over. Um, in this one book, um, the uh, setting is of a dystopian future. And I'm going to make a quote here. And this is around the um, Aboriginal people who live by the side of the polluted swamp. The first quote, the first thing they saw on their arrival at the lake that no longer belonged to them was the audacity of the floating junk. Even the tugboats had been left there to rot unfettered and untethered. Undeterred, the traditional owners ignored the view as though the lake was still the same tranquil place it had always been from time immemorial, before the day that their people had been frightened away. And in this way, she's describing a way of viewing the present that is still um, reflecting of the past and a way of living in the present as though a future is possible beyond this dystopia. And both texts are ending on a message of hope. And I think that's a um, really important way to end this talk. Both of these texts are a form of knowledge production. They teach us lessons. Um, we can conceptualize this as what um, Joanne Archibald calls indigenous story work. Stories become lessons about ways of being in relation to kin, country and each other. And they have consequences for locating ourselves and living out decolonial futures in response to the fleshy Anthropocene in the present. And I'll pass over to Siobhan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maeve, for such a rich and insightful presentation. And it's incredible the way that you help us to understand the importance of these narratives and these stories for thinking about rethinking what we take for granted, what the future might hold. So it's super powerful. And for everyone else who felt similarly 
Um, so intrigued and provoked in a very good way <laughs> by Maeve's presentation, please put your comments in the Q&A section on Zoom and we can come to those later. For now, we'll hear from um, Dr. Siobhan McDonald. So Siobhan is a senior lecturer with the Reed Group and she is both a lawyer and an anthropologist. So not the sort of person you really want to pick a fight with. Um, Siobhan puts her multiple expertises into incredibly valuable use through focusing on real world change. And this is especially around climate change, disasters, gender and displacement. Um, she works with Indigenous people in Australia and the broader Oceania region. And this is especially, but not exclusively, around issues of land rights. Um, she has been a lead drafting committee negotiator for the Republic of Vanuatu on issues of climate change and regional political issues. Um, and I'm constantly energized by Siobhan's passion for education and her contribution in so many different avenues of her work and her personal life to the betterment of the world. So we'll hear from Siobhan now. Just gotta unmute yourself though, Siobhan. Thanks. Mute. Right. Thank you, Beck. That's very kind. Um, I want to just flow on from Maeve's presentation, but offer a really um, different take that pulls through some of the same themes. So what I want to do today is look at some Indigenous perspectives on the Anthropocene and really pull into this idea of the importance of attachment to land. I want to describe some of the failure of UN FCCC processes, so the big climate negotiation processes, to take account of Indigenous perspectives. And I want to look at some of these spaces of resistance, uh, the, some of the work I do in Vanuatu around climate litigation, but also around Indigenous access to land. So, the starting point for this, and I've pulled through a, a series of photos um, of my experience of being caught uh, in the bushfires and at the evacuation centre around New Year's Eve this year. Uh, but the starting point for this work is really that the recognition that Indigenous people, and particularly those living in the Arctic and Oceania, are some of the most vulnerable to climate impacts and that this is centrally a climate justice issue because they really have, they produce no carbon emissions at all. So in Australia, we've got Indigenous communities with increasingly restricted access to water, particularly in Central Australia in the desert. Um, and another one of my PhD students, Evie Rose, uh, is starting to work on those issues. There's the Torres Strait population that are weathering the impacts of climate change. Um, the Indigenous population, uh, particularly the Ewan people of, of the coastal area of New South Wales, but also stretching into Victoria, were hugely impacted by the 2019-2020 bushfires. So a quarter of that population uh, was actually Indigenous identifying. Um, so then if we look at what decolonising the Anthropocene means, it needs to really um, acknowledge that that part of the starting point is a deep dive into these ideas of property and relationships to landscape. So my work is similarly informed by Carl White's very important work around this idea that colonialism and capitalism have laid the paths for industrialization and mil militarization and has created this kind of carbon intensive economics which has produced anthropogenic climate change. And so what White argues is that climate change is best understood as an intensification or intensified episode of colonisation. And I'm very informed too by the work of, of um, Todd and Davis, as you'll see in this presentation. So in the wake of the 2019-2020 bushfires in Australia, we had Indigenous scholars like our own ANU scholar, Biomi Williamson, and the brilliant Vanessa Kavanagh reminding us that the grief of the loss of sacred places for Indigenous people is compounded by the trauma of dispossession. It's compounded by that experience of colonisation in Australia. So Indigenous ontological belonging to land alters the attenuation of grief associated with the fires. 
it alters that experience of climate change and climate impacts. And decolonizing the Anthropocene needs to begin from that frame of reference. So Indigenous writer Lorena Allum wrote after the fires, like you, I've watched, I've watched in anguish and horror as the fires lay waste to precious you and land, taking everything with it, lives, homes, animals, trees. But for First Nations people, it's also burning our memories, our sacred places, all the things who make us who we are. And I've had the privilege of working alongside two very brilliant UN scholars, Emily Fishpool and Sam Provost, um, both of whom are in the Fenner School at ANU who work um, collaboratively in a research project with UN elders who, after the bushfires, really described that part of their grief as this concern um, for this inter interconnected multi-species kinship um, around this set of ideas. The birds are who we are. If they are lost, we are lost. So this deep set of um, ontological framings around attachment to land and to the species that inhabit place in all kinds of ways. So pulling from Indigenous Australia into Oceania, like Indigenous Australians across Oceania, Indigenous people express similarly deep ontological connections to land, terrestrial and marine environments. So I use land here as a shorthand for all of those sets of connections. So in 2016, Henry Puna, the Prime Minister of Rarotonga, the Cook Islands, said, many of my people do not know the earth as a planet among stars. They only know that their world is made up of islands and surrounding seas. They only see that parts of their islands continue to wash away and they wonder why we've lied to them, that sea level rise is a gradual thing of the future. So this is the, the kinds of articulation of climate impacts and the ways in which these are impacting people's entire ways of life. So across the region, the growing threats posed by sea level rise and all kinds of other climate impacts have prompted discussion of relocation and resettlement, either within state boundaries or within the broader region. And these are particularly acute for very threatened coral atoll nations. So these images are the images that photos that I took in Tuvalu um, when I was there last year at the Pacific Island Forum leaders meeting. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, a display that the children of Tuvalu put in place for the leaders as they arrived to the meeting. So the Prime Minister of Australia or the Prime Ministers of the region were greeted by these young children sitting waist high in water um, with the scene of disaster behind them to really symbolise what they, they are concerned they're facing for their future. So relocations often strongly opposed by Pacific Islanders, including people like people from Tuvalu who reject being represented as climate refugees. And we can see that in things like the 2008 Niue Declaration, which said, um, including for people from low-lying atoll nations, just this continual importance of Pacific peoples continuing to live on their own countries for as long as possible. So people do not want to move. They very much see moving as a last resort because of these deep um, ontological, spiritual belonging and attachments to land. So then how is this taken into account in international negotiation spaces? And really, there's an absence of the capacity to negotiate around some of these issues. So the first failure of these UNFCCC negotiations to take into account Indigenous voices comes from the fact that all of the negotiations are state-centred. So you are represented at a state level. So you, if you're an Indigenous population of a state, like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, you don't have a mechanism for representation. So even though Indigenous people of the Arctic, for example, are profoundly impacted by climate impacts, they have not been mentioned as a separate category of affected groups, 
impacted by climate change historically in the UNFCCC mechanism. So where Indigenous people have had a voice has been when nation states are actually Indigenous. So the example for that is obviously Oceania. And in relation to Oceanic leaders, leaders have been um, extremely disappointed, increasingly disappointed by the lack of the capacity for UNFCCC negotiation processes to address some of their central concerns. So I want to drill into one example of that. So under the UNFCCC mechanism, the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, the WIM, establishes a framework for addressing the issues of loss and damage for what is known as, as the loss and damage that occurs due to climate impacts that, that occur beyond adaptation. So the kinds of climate impacts that you can't adapt to. So for example, sea level rise if you are a coral atoll nation. No amount of adaptation or mitigation past a certain point can combat the projected increase in sea level rise. So this framework establishes these two areas of loss and damage, material loss, such as impact on infrastructure and the formal economy, and what's known as non-economic loss and damage. So this is the space that I negotiate into um, that I've had the privilege to negotiate into representing the Republic of Vanuatu. So be beyond the material impact, such as damage to infrastructure and the formal economy, what's even more important often for Pacific people, many of whom are employed in the subsistence economy or traditional economy, and for many people in small island developing states, in the context of long-term climate-induced displacement, are the non-economic losses associated with categories like loss of human life, cultural connection, and losing connection to their ancestral land and places of belonging. So go back to that first set of ideas around what was being described as the climate impacts from the bushfire. These are all non-economic. So if you ask people how they were impacted by the fires, they would describe trauma, they would describe loss of human life, they would describe the impact on their families. They would describe all of these aspects and elements. For Indigenous people, they would describe loss of access to place. They would describe all the grief associated with the, the threatened species. All of these and loss of animal life, all of these aspects are what we call non-economic loss. So these descriptions of the lost face by people with having to relocate away from your place of belonging for people across Oceania are contained within this non-economic loss framing. And for Indigenous people, these climate impacts are not experienced as separate categories of loss, but as con continual cu cumulative and enduring impacts of colonial dispossession, genocide and environmental degradation. So they're not seen as a standalone impact related only to climate change. And these kinds of climate impacts are things like the loss of human life, loss of cultural continuity, loss of language and identity, loss of access to sacred sites, traditional houses and structures, burial sites, all of which cause deep grief and can have devastating impacts on health and well-being of individuals and cultural groups loss of traditional knowledge and loss of access to traditional materials. However, despite the importance of these non-economic losses to the ways of life of people in Oceania and Australia, they're rarely taken into account in assessments of climate change impacts, either in national policy and risk assessment or in these spaces of UNFCCC negotiation processes. So at a UNFCCC level, there is no way in negotiations of articulating a value attached to any of these non-economic losses. So this increasingly has prompted countries like the country that I work with, Vanuatu, to consider other policy options to address climate impacts including regional negotiations, national policy development, and international climate litigation. 
So I'm part of Vanuatu's climate litigation task force. And this is part of the space that I'm now turning to around this space of oceanic resistance. So Vanuatu is currently pursuing an international court of justice test case seeking an advisory opinion around the impacts on countries caused by climate change with particular reference to sea level rise. And that looks like it will be a United Nations General Assembly resolution requesting an ICJ, an International Court of Justice advisory opinion on climate impacts. So this action and its outcomes have the potential to influence multilateral negotiations and provide hopefully a much needed avenue for oceanic states and other climate vulnerable countries to seek redress for the growing impacts from sudden and slow onset hazards caused by climate change. But I want to take us back to this idea of land where we began. And I want to pose this question of how can we begin to create alternate futures that redress the injustice of colonisation, environmental degradation and the increasing threat of climate impacts. And land access is really key to this. So maintaining or improving Indigenous access to land, marine and terrestrial environments is central to ensuring that communities are adequately resourced to address climate change adaptation. So in Australia, crucially, this involves redress from the legacies of dispossession. And this is a conversation that's much more easily had in the centre of Australia than it is around urban Australia. This conversation of redress, of handing back Indigenous land under Indigenous control is a conversation that we need to be able to have. So Indigenous Australia and Oceania, this involves the return of land to Indigenous control. It isn't simply about describing acts like cultural burning. It's actually about holding the integrity of Indigenous systems, of Indigenous knowledge practices and of Indigenous management over land. So the last story I want to tell you is a, is a really good one. And it's about a case that I ran um, with a local lawyer in Vanuatu over these two huge areas of land, these two leases, you can see them numbered in um, North Afate. This is a map of Afate, the central island of Vanuatu. So this is 3,750 hectares of land that was taken um, in an illegal land grab by the Minister of Lands. These are the two remaining big customary tribal areas of land belonging to the Lalepa people. And last year, we won the land case um, to win it back. So it's now back under Indigenous control. And this is, you know, this is a test case now in Vanuatu for how you, um, how you challenge leases on, on the grounds of ministerial fraud. Uh, and there's been a subsequent case this year, which, is all, which I was also involved in advising on, which has also challenged a second lease on the grounds of ministerial fraud. So both of these cases now have brought land back under Indigenous control again. And this is a crucial issue for this group of people. Um, as population grows, as there's less access to subsistence gardening, this gives them a whole other track of customary land to live and farm and work on. Um, so these are not ambit issues that we're discussing. This is not just about philosophical framings when we're describing decolonizing the Anthropocene. And this is practical, meaningful adaptation pathways that create really tangible um, outcomes in terms of people's lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. That is incredibly powerful stuff. Um, instead of me waxing lyrical about how much I appreciated what you've both said, I might pose to you both a question that came through in the Q&A um, from Emily. And so Emily is interested in hearing your thoughts on how to redirect conversations from Anthropocene and environmental saviorism to decolonial modes of justice. And Emily shares the example of hearing a comment that was along the lines of decolonization is important, but stopping climate change is more important. So where are these kind of compartmentalized views coming from and how do we start getting past that? Um, 
I might go to May first, if that's okay, and then on to Siobhan. Sure. Thanks for the question, Emily. Um, I think it's a really important one, and I think in the case of Fenner um, and many other departments, is that when you have a mixing of people from very different academic backgrounds, it can be um, there can be a bit of a clash. So um, one thing that could be worth mentioning to people is this idea that knowledge and power are co-produced and that climate change and decolonization are not separate struggles. Um, so perhaps introducing them to some different scholarship could be a useful thing. Introduce them to the work of Linda Tuvi by Smith, Martin Nakada, Aileen Morton Robinson, these Indigenous scholars that many of us are aware of, but other people might not be. Um, and find ways of um, challenging their normative assumptions. Um, yeah, it's not always easy, but I think that's the task there. I think, um, should, so should I, will I, okay. Um, I think that, I think that's a really powerful and important question. Um, often we can think very much in silos. Um, I think, you know, as I kind of described that when we're really thinking about these issues of climate justice, we absolutely have to bring those conversations together. But it, re it rarely happens um, in mainstream climate change kind of discourse. So I think there's a real need to kind of proactively message that a lot more. Um, yeah. Thank you both so much. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left before we're due to wrap up, but I'll put to you a very brief summary of a question that came through from James. And so James is asking what your thoughts are on the potential for an acceleration of decolonization due to the disruption created, I was going to say provided, but that's not quite the way we want to think about it, created by COVID. There's more nuance to the question, but I'll ask for your reflections on that. So Siobhan, perhaps you can go first and then Maeve, if you would like to comment after Siobhan, that would be wonderful. Um, I, it's, a, it's a really complicated question for me to unpack. Um, James, I think on the one, I mean, I, I kind of think about it from a couple of different lenses. The first one is that uh, I, I also work in the spaces of disasters and there's been a really interesting unfolding of response to disasters, particularly Tropical Cyclone Harold in the Pacific. There has to, there's been much more effort to localise simply because all of the external actors that would usually be heading into the Pacific haven't been able to head in. So I think you have seen a stepping up of, of local actors in all kinds of ways. But the other, the flip side of all of that is the amount of funding that's gone to address these huge um, humanitarian crises has been just tiny compared to what happened with Tropical Cyclone Pam because the attention globally has been on COVID. And um, so, you know, from a Vanuatu perspective, it was another Category 5 cyclone. 45% of the population was impacted. People are still living in evacuation centres. Um, there's, you know, there are, is such a tiny relief effort and there's such a tiny amount of funding compared to what happened five years ago with Cyclone Pam uh, because the international attention of Australia and the world has just not been there. So, um, and as for, I don't, I mean, I think the, the story of the COVID response in remote Indigenous Australia is an extraordinary success story at the moment. And it's been largely because it's been led by Aboriginal health organisations who've been messaging that message. So it's, it is only Aboriginal health organisations who could have messaged out into remote communities, don't go to funerals, for example. So there's been an incredible um, incredibly proactive role that's been played by those organisations messaging to their own communities. Um, and I think that is 
absolutely how things should occur. Um, and there's a lot to be learned from that. Faith, would you like to comment as well? Sure, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like we need a bit more context to the question, but I don't feel that positive about COVID as an opportunity for Indigenous peoples to step up. Um, I think Indigenous peoples are just as affected, if not more at risk to COVID. Um, yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure that we are seeing we, if by we you mean um, yeah, Anglo-Australian government stepping, sitting back. I'm not sure that that's happening either. And we can see, you know, for example, what's been happening in Melbourne with the lockdown of public housing buildings, for example, is more intervention. <laughs> Um, into people's lives. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's always potential for acceleration of decolonization in and out of COVID. I have, yeah, positive views for the future, but I'm not sure that COVID necessarily presents a particular opportunity. Thank you so much, Maeve. And it is sort of one of those questions that giving it a cursory overview in a couple of minutes doesn't quite work, but there's heaps more there to talk about. But we are at the end of the time that we had for the webinar. So thank you both so much. It has been such an extraordinary pleasure and privilege to hear your incredible, sharp insights on this issue of decolonizing the Anthropocene. Know that there's been a couple more questions that have come through. So is clearly a conversation that is by no means resolved and I hope that it will be a conversation that can continue. So I'll also um, thank the wonderful team and the resources environment and development group and the Crawford School of Public Policy who were behind putting this webinar together and the future series. I hope you can join us and I know it's also really strange being an attendee at one of these things where you can't make noise by hitting your hands together to show your appreciation, but we can see the really kind messages coming through to thank Maeve and Siobhan. So thank you all for that and we'll wrap up now. Thanks <laughs> thank everybody. You, thank you. Thank you.